and we do have some new developments out of Israel where an agreement has been made to put a brief pause on fighting in northern Gaza. The political analyst Rick Epps joining us now to explain this new decision and what it could mean for the war going forward. Rick, always good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see both of you. you kind of give us the layout right now. What's the situation on the ground? Well, the, the situation on the ground, obviously, they've got the tanks that have now moved in. Uh, this is the next step of the next phase of the operation was to basically go house by house, you know, area by area, and st go after Hamas wherever they may be within the, within Gaza. Um, which is, you know, this is the expected plan. This is the war plan. Um, but the bombardment has continued. The escalation has continued. And even though we now, as we've just seen, and was just stated that there is a, uh, a ceasefire for a few hours a day, uh, I, I, you know, which feels good, but I think is, uh, is very, it just doesn't mean a whole lot, I don't believe, personally. Okay, so when you say it doesn't mean a whole lot, we're talking about the humanitarian aid that's going to be no. um, brought in. Four hour, there's a four hour window, they're yeah. saying this is daily. Yeah. How, how exactly does this work? Is it, is it the same four hours every day? Uh, what are the rules of engagement, so to speak, and, and how Cyprus is involved? How does this work? Well, the, the, that's the problem. It's like it's not the same four hours every day, right? They don't want to have it be where, you know, well, we know it, you know, from 12 to 4 on, right. you know, every day because they're afraid of what, you know, there may be attacks and so forth. So Israel said they would give a few hours of, of warning or, you know, saying, hey, okay, this is your four hour window. And that could be any time, day or night, that they would allow this to take place. Uh, and in that time, the, the, Palestinian folks are supposed, to be, are supposed to be able to get out, you know, get away from the area and give them a, a, a set time to do that. Um, the problem is, with anything, they, how do they get out? I mean, how, how are you supposed to get out? You have no car, you have no modes of transportation, you're hoping that someone or maybe some entity can remove you, but it's hard to just walk your way out of Gaza and think you're going to get to the south where it's a supposedly safe area uh, during that time. So it's while it sounds wonderful in a lot of ways, um, and certainly it could be possibly a precursor toward a possible ceasefire, you know, a lot of the damage is already done, and we can talk about that in a moment, but it's, uh, you know, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's certainly nice to have somebody not shooting at you for four hours a right. day, but on the other hand, uh, the other 20 hours could certainly be, you know, hell on earth. But, who, but I'm so sorry, but who is behind the aid, though? Who is offering the aid? Well, this is what well, you mean in terms of to the to the Gazan folks. Yes. Well, I mean you have certain a lot of bodies that are in there playing on this, right? So you have the United Nations on one hand that's trying to get aid and food and folks into those people. You know, there's no electricity, no water. They've cut everything. The Israelis have cut. The Israeli government has cut everything in that region. So the, in order for those people to be able to, to even survive, they've got to rely on international aid to do so. Mm. Certainly, you could argue, you know, as some of the peripheral states have offered tacit support but nothing substantive. Uh, so most of it res resides in international agencies that are providing support and get, trying to get food into those people. Well, and for a lot of these people, I mean, four hours, they say, is not enough. Yeah. Uh, let's get to this, too, because we know Iran and Hamas leaders met in Moscow back in April. What do you think this meeting was all about, the purpose of this meeting? Well, you know, it's interesting because when you, I always tell people, follow the money, right? And, you fo and follow the, you know, everybody's got a puppet master. So if you look at who controls Hamas and Hezbollah and, and the Islamic Jihad, for the most part, it's Iran, you know, and Iran supplies, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to those entities uh, for weapons and, and, and materials, right, and for, and for financial support. But then behind Iran is also a player, and that's Russia. Mm. As a matter of fact, on the eve of the, of the incursion uh, that can, was committed on October 7th, there was 100, there's, there 100 million or a little more than 100 million that was funneled from a Moscow-based cryptocurrency account to Hamas uh, just prior to the, to the incursion. So there are players on the periphery um, that also have been manipulating this game. And when, you, and when people go, wow, I didn't know that, or why would that be? Well, there are reasons why Russia wants to see destabilization. There mm -hmm. are reasons why Iran wants to see destabilization in that region. And so this is just the extension of war by business. And this is how this game is unfortunately politically played. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, I, we go back to this, because you're talking about now Russia yeah. potentially standing to gain something from this war and the destabilization. Yeah. And, and then there's 
there's the civilians, right? Because we're talking about the war parts. Yeah. They're the civilians, and that's what people are most concerned about. Yeah. I, I want to go back to that just for a second here yeah. because although it does sound okay, it sounds like good news. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be a, a window every single day, four hours. Okay, we get humanitarian aid. How does this pose a risk, though? How does this become dangerous? I don't want to be like I don't want to play devil's advocate, yeah. so to speak. But yeah. how does this? How is this bad? Are you referring to the four-hour window? Yeah. Well, the four-hour window is not a bad thing, I'm not, and I'm not suggesting it's a bad okay. thing because it certainly that gives people an opportunity to try to, to leave. To leave. Right. The problem is that again, it's it's. It's the optic they're trying to create, not the actual what's going on on the ground, right? So while you can say, okay, you can leave now, like I mentioned earlier, doesn't mean that you have a way to leave, right? Saying you can go is it's an like, opportunity. It's an opportunity, but is there in reality, we, you know, the times that we've seen people trying to get away, remember they were still bombing in the south when they were telling them to go south. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, in terms of on the Palestinian view of the world, Okay, the four hours. I'm not. I feel thankful nobody's shooting at me for four hours. But on the other hand, I have nowhere to go in those four hours. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I might go a few miles away, but I can't get far enough away to, from where all the incursions are happening because Israel is going to continue, as Netanyahu has said, and as the president of Israel Herzog has said, they're going to continue this onslaught until they get rid of Hamas. Well. How do you get rid of Hamas? It, it wasn't the biggest worry, the reason why they didn't want to do a ceasefire anyways, because of what Hamas can then you know, come together and then plan another attack, or I, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah that's because exactly what they had said. You were giving them a four hour window, but is Hamas going to and plan something honor that? Right. Yeah. yeah, honor that window, because it's not just the IDF, correct? It's, yeah, so. so both sides have to honor it, and then you think about, well, what's, is there a rationale for Hamas to try to do so? Mildly, but it's you know it, people assume that Hamas is this highly organized entity, and certainly at the top there are a few players who certainly are part of the of that. But if you get down to on the ground, it's not as it's not as organized as people think on the ground, mm -hmm. and it's probably a good thing for them if you're if you're Hamas in that group because the more decentralized you are, the harder it is to kill you. You know, it's hard to cut off the head of the snake if you would if in fact you've mm -hmm. now you know blocked up. Nobody knows where the head of the snake is. So much to talk about there all this is something a new lot developing to talk about. in the Middle oh, East. Yes. Um, Rick Epps, always good to see you. Thank you so much. Great to see you.